Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 29th webinar of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. Today we have an interesting topic, and the question is: Does 3D gait analysis improve our decision? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And for that, we welcome have to the 29th expert. webinar of Pediatric yeah. Orthopedic Society of India. Today's lecture is by Dr. Dr. Ella Prasad. She is and from the France. Is, does and really just to give short uh, background about her, she did her undergraduate and postgraduate study from Spain. And after that, she did her fellowship from France. Then she did her neuroorthopedic fellowship with uh, Dr. Freeman Miller from Delwell uh, Dupont Hospital. In addition to that, he, she did a master's in biomechanics. And since 2004, she is at uh, Robert Debre University Hospital at Paris. At present, she is head of the CP program um, at that hospital. She has a vast academic interest, and uh, to her name, there are 23 publications. And every orthopedic surgeon has something extracurricular activity or interest, and she has a wide interest. She is expert of sailing. In addition to that, she has an interest in roller skating. And the important point is she's also a good cook. So with that short um, background, I will go on to welcome Dr. Freeman Miller. Actually, he does not need any introduction. A very good friend of India. He has visited many uh, POSICON as well as uh, Indian Academy of Cerebral Palsy meetings also. So uh, Freeman Miller, I would say only one thing. His book, now the second edition is already published and the book is an encyclopedia of cerebral palsy. Whichever topic you want to read about cerebral palsy, you will find in that book. And that's one of the comprehensive manual about cerebral palsy. So with that short introduction, I would like to introduce my uh, other friend, Mauro Mores from Brazil. Mauro is also interested in cerebral palsy. And he's at present consultant at ACD Hospital, which is one of the largest hospital dealing with uh, children with disability at Sao Paulo in Brazil. He's director of Gate Laboratory. The another important point is like he's a secretary of uh, Brazilian Society of Pediatric Orthopedics. And we are trying to establish a good relation with, uh, between Brazil and India. He is also a member of POSNA, EPOS, American Academy of Cerebral Palsy, and ISMEC. Before I hand over to uh, Dr. Prasado, I just would like to uh, tell you about the windows of opportunities. Please visit our website, www.posi.in, and try to get information about POSI fellowships. There are a lot of opportunities for England as well as international uh, fellowships. And I request you to visit that and apply for that uh, fellowship. So with that, I hand over to Dr. Prasado for her lecture. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see, I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, yeah, full screen. Perfect. Okay, so um, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Dirim for organizing these webinars and for inviting me today. I have to say I've been uh, twice to India, so I think I would consider today that this is my third uh, virtual trip. Uh, thank you very much to all our panelists for uh, being there uh, with me today. And always a special thanks to uh, Freeman Miller because he's always there. He's always been there for me as a mentor, as a very good friend too. So today, uh, what I want to share with you is uh, some thoughts I have about uh, gate analysis. 
I will also share some other thoughts that I borrow from the literature. Uh, I want to show you how I use uh, 3D gait analysis in my daily clinical practice. And finally, I will try to answer this question that's been chosen as a title for my presentation. Does 3D gait analysis improve decision making? If we think about gait, we do know that uh, visual or observational analysis uh, is not always enough, uh, mainly when we need uh, to come out with some uh, therapeutic options. If we compare instrumented analysis uh, versus observational, uh, we would say that it will allow for data quantification we can also recognize uh, different gait patterns. Uh, the measurements obtained from GateLab uh, would be more objective, of course, within a certain technical and human limits, and is also a very good way to share data for decision making and also in order to evaluate results. Before uh, we go into human motion, I wanted to invite you to take also a virtual trip to Paris. Then you go into the Louvre Museum and you admire this painting from Jericho. It was 1821. And one thing I want you to do is look how the horse's legs were represented during gallop. A few years later, these two men were born, one in UK, the other one in France. They share some characteristic that was that both were very interested in movement. Muybridge was a photographer, Marais was a physiologist, and Muybridge uh, got a special um, order from the government the governor of California, who was very interested in horses races, and he really wanted to get more insight in horses movement. So uh, this photographer took all these pictures. And if you remember that painting I showed you before, and if you compare both, you can see that as a matter of fact, visual analysis is not always enough to analyze movement. Now, I will let you know uh, what were the reasons why myself, I became interested in gait analysis. After my residency in orthopedics, I really wanted to become involved in neuroorthopedics. Of course, I wanted to make good choices, the best choices for my patients. And I did realize that I need to analyze to understand movement. Gait. But I also wanted to get involved in clinical now, research. I will let you know. And I felt uh, that I need to manage objective data. And I also need and tools to be able to teach others. So I spent a couple of years uh, with Freeman Miller uh, at DuPont Hospital, I thought it was the right place to be. I went after for a short time also to Gillette. And I guess that after that initial training, I became a sort of independent worker. Although I have to tell you, that sometimes I still need working aids. So I go to see friends and I exchange uh, knowledge with them. So the first goal was understand gait. I think that um, 3D gait analysis 
uh, what can really provide is a large amount of quantitative data, uh, usually from a standard report, we can get a video and spatial temporal parameters. We get a lot of graphs representing uh, motion kinematics. We also get some insight about uh, the power, the forces that are underneath motion and can sometimes explain some problems. Uh, we also get uh, electromyography and we can get plantar pressure. So it's really a lot of data. The good thing also we got from gait analysis is that the common gait deviations could be grouped into gait patterns or gait classifications. It's not that uh, all patients uh, would feel in one of these types because uh, gait is actually a um, full branch of uh, patterns, abnormalities. But what I think is very useful from these classifications is to be able to uh, communicate, to exchange uh, between professionals. And of course, uh, gait analysis guidelines for management, and it also constitutes a framework for evaluation and treatment. I think it's important to keep in mind that gait analysis report has to be interpreted. It's not that it's going to tell us what to do, but we need to establish a link between the gait abnormalities and clinical pathology and for example, to be able to make the difference between primary gait problems and compensatory mechanisms. For me, the advantage of 3D gait analysis is this identification of abnormal kinematic patterns. One clear example is a stiff knee. A stiff knee is being defined from knee kinematics as insufficient knee flexion during swing. Then um, we could look at a video, for example, like uh, these two pictures uh, represent a, a 2D uh, image. The problem would be that if we want to calculate what uh, the angle for the knee would be, it may become a difficult task. Although uh, we also can use sometimes some software that would uh, give us an approximative uh, measurement of these uh, two-dimensional angles. However, if we uh, need uh, to propose treatment, it's not only that uh, we need to recognize that there is a stiff knee pattern, but we also need to know a little bit about the possible causes. So we want to want a look into clinical examination uh, see whether uh, we find retus femoris spasticity or contracture. Uh, we want to go into kinematic course to see if what's being described as characteristics of a stiff knee are confirming that the patient really has a stiff knee. We also want to look into the EMG activity of retos femoris or both uh, retos femoris and vasti to check that is really a, a normal activity. From kinetics and spatial temporal parameters, we also can have some help because they would be related to some things that can cause a stiff knee like for example, when a patient is walking too slowly, or if, for example, as you can see in these two uh, curves, uh, if we have a slow motion for other uh, joints uh, different from the knee, like the ankle or the hip, then this can influence the amount of power that's generated for motion and these are also things that can be related to a stiff knee. So as a matter of fact, uh, when we need to decide what to do, it's important that we can uh, combine all this information together 
the data coming from uh, clinical examination. It's important to know also whether this uh, kinematic characteristic it really represents a problem for the patient or not, because that could determine whether we are going to want to treat or not. For me, uh, one important advantage of having 3D data is uh, to be able to have a better understanding of what happens in the transverse plane, that is what we usually call uh, the analysis of torsional and rotational travels. I wanted to give you an example here with this young woman who came to our clinic. She is 15 with a very good functional level. And actually she wanted to have a second opinion because she had been advised um, to have femoral the rotation osteotomies bilateral. She did not have any previous surgery. She had the previous year uh, botulinum toxin treatment on the adductors, hamstrings, and gastrocnemius muscles. The reason why, um, on top of the video, I also um, showed you these um, pictures which are uh, moments that I've taken from the video, is because uh, even before I go into the corpse, when I look at uh, possible causes of uh, rotation, torsional abnormalities, I like to look at how uh, the patella is oriented. I think it's useful also for the video purposes to um, put some mark or sticker or something over the patella, then you can better appreciate the orientation. Um, I think that uh, when, for example, if we are thinking like in this case, uh, that uh, femoral antiversion could be the main cause of the internal rotation, we tend to see uh, internal uh, patella uh, pointing internally, uh, throughout mostly all the cycle. Then, usually when uh, is weather is better aligned during swim phase, that mean uh, or that may mean that other causes are possible, and not only the femoral interversion as the main cause. Um, like for example, uh, I look at initial contact, so I do know that um, things that may influence. Uh, the orientation of the patella at this moment can be, for example, uh, tight adductors, can be, for example, uh, abnormal pelvic rotation, can also be the fact that the knee is too flex at this point. I think all those parameters have to be taken into account when we uh, analyze uh, this uh, type of um, problem. Um, also, uh, something that may influence uh, the alignment on the transverse plane for the lower limb uh, during a mid stance is if we do have uh, an excess of plantar flexion, meaning that uh, the main contact uh, for the foot with the floor would be only the forefoot. So that sometimes may create a rotational moment uh, that influences also the rotation. So let's look a little bit into the kinematics. Um, for those who are really, really not familiar with curves, um, I don't intend to go uh, deep uh, into kinematics, but uh, since we are talking about three-dimensional gait analysis, I thought that it was necessary to show you how uh, we could use uh, this information uh, to have a better idea of what the cause of a, of a problem could be. Like here, for example, what you see are uh, curves that represent the sagittal, the frontal, and the transverse plane. Kinematics are measurements of uh, joint angles 
throughout the motion, throughout the gait cycle in this case. We usually represent in green what the normal values would be. And then we choose uh, to represent in blue for the right uh, side, so the right uh, lower limb, and red for the uh, left lower limb. So for this uh, young lady, what I would uh, go to look for is um, here, you see that there is more pelvic rotation than normal. This movement could, of course, influence uh, the internally rotated gait that we observe. We look at also hip rotation curve. Um, I think that when we see uh, permanent internal rotation, could may be more related to an abnormal bony torsion. However, uh, when I see patterns like this one, where uh, the hip internal rotation can be uh, increased, but it's variable, and it's not the same amount all the time. Myself, I tend to think that this rotation that is variable is probably being influenced by things that are happening at different levels, like pelvis, like how foot, uh, the contact uh, of the foot on the floor is, uh, and for example, things that also could happen in the frontal plane, like it's not exactly the case here, but if we find a lot of uh, pelvic obliquity or hip adduction, that also can influence the tendency to uh, go into internal rotation of the hip. I just select these uh, two kinetics curves. These ones represent ankle power. Uh, it's one of the important things uh, for gait to be functional, uh, to be able to develop good power at the ankle. Um, I think that uh, gait analysis uh, not also show us how movement is, but also can give us um, through kinetics, a little bit of an idea how uh, the patient would be from a muscular point of view, uh, whether there is enough strength or not, uh, how is uh, dealing with balance and motor control. If we summarize a little bit for this patient, uh, once we analyze video, we look also at kinematic patterns we may have a little bit of an idea of what is influencing rotation, like pelvic movements, like the fact that she has an early heel rise during a stand phase, but we also wanna look at clinical examination. So what we see here is that he has some tightness of the adductor muscles, she has hip internal rotation and external rotation that would be uh, on the lower and upper limits of normal. Uh, she has some hamstrings uh, tightness because popliteal angle was uh, 70, both, both sides. And we also uh, look at ankle dorsiflexion where we see that there is a good dorsiflexion with bended knee meaning that the soleus is not short, but maybe the gastrocnemius are a little bit short. And that can or could explain, for example, this plateau that we see here on the dorsiflexion of the ankle when we look at kinematics. So actually, for this patient, we recommended um, not to do femoral derotations, but do adductors hamstrings, and gastrocnemius lengthenings. Um, it is a shame because, because of the COVID problem, Gate Lab is closed. So I really couldn't get a post-op gait analysis, but if you cannot trust me, I seen her two weeks ago, and she was walking with a heel contact, uh, with a normal foot progression angle, a better abduction of the hips, 
and less uh, rotational movements of the pelvic bone. So I would conclude, uh, although it's a short term, that it probably was a good idea not to propose uh, femoral derotation osteotomies. One of the good things with gait analysis is that we can do research. So many times uh, when we are thinking about treatment for patients, we wanna go into the literature and we're gonna go uh, and search for some answers to our questions. Uh, here we find some recommendations uh, for femoral derotation osteotomies. If we look at this, uh, we could consider that our patient could be a candidate for the derotations based on clinical examination and was limited um, based on the hip internal rotation uh, during gait. But the other important thing to consider is the functional impairment, which actually she didn't have that much. She was mainly complaining about stiffness. She mentioned that after she had Botox, she was feeling better because her gait was more fluent. Um, the literature also um, says that if sometimes we are in the borderline, uh, the limit of a recommendation, it would be uh, more risky in this case to get a femoral derotation osteotomy because uh, what's been shown is that when internal hip rotation from kinematics is moderate, um, there are more risk of uh, finding or uh, having a uh, too much correction rather than the opposite. So uh, we also sometimes wanna, wanna follow these uh, literature recommendations. Anyway, um, it's important to remember that both uh, clinical examination and gait analysis are the basis for uh, the treatment indications. We actually did some research on the transverse plane and which is pretty consistent with, uh, in general, the, the publications in the literature. We did find that um, most of the limbs in patients with uh, diplegia had a rotational torsional problem. The causes were at different levels, and I think that's what really makes the diagnosis and the uh, decision making complicate if we don't have some kinematics. Uh, for us, when we look at uh, the main causes for patella turning inwards and also for the internal foot progression angle, we uh, mainly saw that uh, the principal cause or the most common one was pelvic internal rotation. And uh, curiously, as a matter of fact, we did not find a good correlation between femoral antiversion and hip rotation. So I think that this is a way uh, to say that you really need to be careful when you decide treatment, mainly if treatment would be based only uh, in a gait observation or physical examination. Gait analysis is not only about kinematics, it's not only about describing motion, but we also learn a lot of uh, dynamic uh, principles from gait analysis. I choose an example of a um, young boy who actually I saw last week when I was preparing the talk. So that remained me um, the importance of keep a good alignment uh, of the body related to the external forces that influence movement. Um, this problem uh, of after uh, tendo Achilles lengthenings, having the risk of going into much dorsiflexion, 
uh, is um, many times advice uh, in the literature, and uh, it makes reference to this uh, couple mm -hmm. that we call a uh, knee extension plantar flexion couple mechanism that um, prevents actually the knee from falling uh, further down uh, the ground reaction forces better. Uh, and this equilibrium, this balance is very important uh, also to uh, make the gate uh, more efficient, uh, just have less uh, energy uh, consumption. So it is the important principles we have uh, to remember when we uh, do surgery, uh, not to lose this balance uh, between uh, muscular lens and between bony segments. Uh, things that we also can see from sometimes gait analysis and kinematics and kinetics are uh, patterns that could be similar, meaning that could be uh, both uh, categorized in the same type, like for example, crouch gait. But if we look into all curves, and into also dynamics, we see that as a matter of fact, um, the pelvis, the pelvis is uh, very uh, differently aligned in both cases. Uh, one of the patients, uh, although he went into crouch, he was an independent worker with very good motor control, whereas the other one was dependent on walking aids. So I think that um, it is important to look at this because not only uh, for um, natural history reasons or that we can uh, pre predict what would be the result of a treatment, but also because like, for example, we are thinking about some uh, hamstring lengthenings, we wanna see uh, if the pelvic bone is uh, more uh, tilted forward or backwards, that could sometimes influence our choices. We go into the next one. So now we are talking a little bit about treatment, about management. I think this is a good uh, representation of how uh, would how what what would be the the role the the place, and I think it's really the central uh, place of gait analysis uh, when we um, wanna analyze problems in uh, gait and in patients with cerebral palsy, and we uh, go through the diagnostic process, and we go through uh, the making decision process. I think that uh, gait analysis per se uh, is not uh, the answer, but it is very important to integrate uh, gait analysis data into this uh, whole uh, process of diagnosis and making decisions. I think that you probably all are familiar with this uh, picture from Dr. Mercer Run that actually uh, represents uh, what happened uh, years ago when um, gait analysis was not really uh, that common. So many times, uh, decisions were made based on clinical examination or a visual uh, analysis. And then patients sometimes uh, had uh, surgeries that were uh, focal, that were not uh, thought with an integrated uh, approach. And see, uh, you see here what actually happened. Um, they had many different uh, surgeries that's why uh, that uh, call uh, birth syndrome. But as a matter of fact, they did not uh, have a global balance, uh, almost never. And even, even though here you see that the final uh, picture looks good, unfortunately for patients, uh, most of the cases, this was not the final result. The ideal uh, situation would be something like this, where we actually want to make a global multidisciplinary diagnosis of problems 
taking into account not only gait, but also the functional level, uh, the life of patient, social uh, aspects, and then we can decide what the best treatment would be for our patient. Um, from a mechanical or biomechanical point of view, what we do want to get is a correction of all problems at the same time in order to achieve a, a good balance between joys. So now this is uh, the most common uh, way to approach uh, surgery for these patients is what is called a uh, single event multilevel surgery. But this um, came actually from the development of uh, three-dimensional gait analysis. So the, the rationale be behind sing single event multilevel surgery would be first to, to establish goals, objectives for treatment. And this has to be based on the understanding of the neurological condition after a full analysis and evaluation of gait problems. And if possible, in the context of a multidisciplinary team uh, with surgeons, but also physical therapists, pediatricians, and uh, other uh, therapists. In order to identify the surgical procedures necessary to reach those goals, it's important also to take into account the influence of natural history of gait related to the functional level of the patient and also for pediatrics, have in take into account what would be the influence of remaining growth on the outcomes. So if we, we need to uh, kind of summarize what the main objectives would be when we treat these patients, I would say we want to improve gait, but we also want to facilitate activities of daily living. And of course, we want to prevent orthopedic deterioration and pain. I will show you a typical case, I would say, uh, is one of my patients. So I think that this case uh, show um, on one side what could be natural history for a diplegic uh, patient, but it will also show what we, the way we could change natural history with our uh, well-planned interventions. Here he is when he is seven, so um, normal uh, cognitive level. Uh, she started working independently at four. Um, then she uh, had some botulinum toxin treatment because uh, he was developing some uh, tightness of the gastroxoleus. He wear orthosis, uh, day and night orthosis, since he uh, was really little. And also he had physical therapy treatment. He did have a lengthening of the gastrocnemius muscle at the age of nine. So in between these two videos, because he really was having trouble uh, with in order to wear the splints because of foot pain. Then um, we didn't see him for a while, and then he comes at 11. We were surprised because uh, we wouldn't expect for a patient with such a good uh, functional level to deteriorate so much. He was at that time mainly complaining about knee pain. Uh, we got a gait analysis, we compare with um, the one we had from before, where he, if you look at knee pattern, was mainly uh, what we would call a, a jumper, a, a kid working with jump knee, too much knee flexion at initial contact, but then a good deal of extension and, and good function during swim phase. And he moved into a pattern, typical pattern of crouch gait with a lot of uh, knee flexion throughout all the, the, the gait cycle. Let's see. Um, for him, uh, when we start discussing about uh, 
if what would be necessary to do, the first thing that uh, we in our team uh, can I mention is what the goals for treatment would be. Um, and something that for me is important about knowing the patient from before is that you have an idea of the prognosis because in general, um, when you see somebody like him, who was an independent walker with very good motor control, good strength, very good cognitive level, and very rapidly deteriorated, you tend to think that it was maybe because on a, of an orthopedic problem, but not because there was some sort of neurological deterioration or something like that. So this for me is an element of indicator of good prognosis, because I do know that if we treat the orthopedic problems, there is no reason why he wouldn't be again, more or less at the same functional level than he was before. So here um, we have the knee x-rays. So no wonder why he was having pain because he developed patella alta with uh, fractures of the lower pole of the patella. Uh, I just, in order to uh, do it uh, shorter and simple for you, uh, tell you what we decide to do based on uh, the um, gait analysis, based on the x-rays, of course, but also on the physical examination. Since he had limited abduction, we decided to do a doctor's lengthenings. We also did, uh, have, uh, did uh, hamstring lengthenings because he had popliteal angles 80 right and 60 left. We decided to do a retros femoris distal resection because uh, the overall run, range of motion of the knee was reduced. Uh, also because um, he had um, an LE test, a positive LE test um, because of the lengthened um, patellar tendon, uh, the retros femoris was somehow uh, shortened. We did decide, although he had uh, previously already gastrocnemius release for some reason, because uh, when we look at um, ankle kinematics in gait analysis, what we actually see is the relationship between a segment that would represent foot and a segment that would represent the leg. However, um, when we clinically look at the feet, there was some uh, hypermobility at the mid-tarsal joint, and that means that as a matter of fact, even though the gait analysis curve show uh, dorsiflexion at the ankle, what he actually had, it was plantar flexion of the hind foot, and then it was, he was starting to have a mid-tarsal break. This is the reason why we decide uh, to do a second uh, gastrocnemius release, not for the solus, only for the gastrocnemius. And we also did patellar advancement in order to um, counteract and correct the knee extensor lack he, was, he had, but he did not have a very important knee flexion contracture because he had only 10 degrees bilateral. Here is uh, the patient uh, one year after the surgery. Just wanted to show you in order to give you a global uh, idea of how he evolved. These other two videos show the same patient three years after surgery. He was doing better than one year after surgery. And the main reason why I wanted to show this case is also because with uh, showing to you all these curves, I really don't wanna scare anybody, but I wanted to say that it's nice. Uh, it's nice to have all this data collected. It's nice that we um, can to look uh, backwards uh, to the past and see how uh, actually the patient evolved 
And what we also have and see is that for these two uh, right uh, columns, here what is represented are both sides, right and left, separately. And then you can see that uh, from the gait analysis at 13 years old, one year after surgery, compared to the other gait analysis three years after surgery, he still got better. So I think that's something important to know also that a patient who has a good functional level, um, at least for the first years when he is young, after surgery, he keeps, he may keep uh, getting better. So um, even though there is some tendency with time to deteriorate, but I think the main point is that these patients still uh, remain in a better situation compared to the baseline before surgery. So this is a sort of conclusion because uh, when we uh, set goals, uh, we also want our patients to be happy. And then we consider that this is important part of our goals for treatment. This is just a case that I won't really develop, but I wanted to mention about something that we currently do. Sometimes because of the pattern of gait, is difficult to decide, for example, for fit, whether we do need to go uh, for some surgery at the same time that we uh, may correct a liver arm, like in this case, uh, the flexion of the knee or not. And if you compare both here uh, before this patient actually improve uh, his level of function because he was uh, working with a walker, he was using a wheelchair, and after surgery, he is not using the walker anymore, and he uses the wheelchair for uh, the long, actually, uh, distances. But the thing is, uh, when we look at feet uh, before the surgery, we were discussing about maybe correct the valgus uh, he had, Although we didn't do, although we didn't do, because we thought, well, we will see what happens with the feet after we correct the rest. And then when we did the post-treatment gait analysis, what happened actually was that one side still was in valgus, but the other one we realized uh, it was mostly uh, in virus of uh, the hind foot. So with this, only wanted to tell you that um, sometimes uh, we need to be careful also about uh, the decisions we make because after we correct certain levels, uh, modifications can be done for other levels. And we may want to wait a little bit and see uh, how uh, everything will evolve later on. Okay, now I just wanted to, to share with you a few papers that uh, this would be a sort of uh, conclusion of everything and uh, we are looking to answer that question. Uh, is, as a matter of fact, three-dimensional gait analysis a good help uh, for decision-making or not? Let's first see what the literature says and then I will let you know what I think. Um, this is a paper um, that uh, shown how uh, the use of gait analysis could influence uh, the uh, amount of surgery that patients uh, had. There are three groups, three cohorts. There are different groups of patients, not the same patients. And the difference between, between them is that there are uh, historical cohorts so the uh, clear uh, blue one where patients treat at a time where there was not in that hospital a gate lab. So decisions for surgery were mainly based on clinical assessment and visual analysis. So when the patients, uh, those group, for that group of patients, when they were around nine years old, it happened that 70% of them had some surgery. Then they, the, the gay lab came to the hospital, and when the gay lab came to the hospital, 
the surgical decisions were made based on gait analysis data. So here you see the other group, the orange one, and you see that uh, surgery that was based on gait analysis data at the same age of nine, uh, less patients had had surgery. And for the third group, the dark blue one, those patients also had some Botox treatment. So um, this um, team of surgeons also wanted to enhance uh, the importance or the, the role that uh, integrating botulinum toxin in the management of these patients could also have some influence uh, in the final uh, decision making uh, related to surgery. But for me, the important thing we, we see here is actually the, the intervention of gait analysis in this uh, decision making process. This is another uh, classical paper where I think that is interesting that when um, a group of surgeons who did not have a gait analysis report when they decide to treat patients, but they were trained in gait analysis when they were compared their decisions to other group of surgeons who didn't have the gait analysis report, but they didn't have any experience with gait analysis, neither it happened that. All of them made changes um, after having the report, but those who had experience in gait analysis did less changes than the other ones. That this may suggest that even though when you don't have a gait analysis report for your patient, if you do know things about gait analysis, you probably uh, get closer uh, to a decision that would be made based on gait analysis. And I think this is an important thing, is the role of uh, gait analysis in uh, knowledge, education, a better understanding of gait. For the amount of surgery, those who did have knowledge about gait analysis tend to do less surgery when they get the report. Whereas the other ones tend to do more surgery because they had think about doing uh, focal things. And then when they see uh, gait in a more integrated approach, they may decide to correct more things at the same time. I think that can be related to this. I just showed you this chart from the same article that uh, tries to explain why the changes. And I think that something is important is like, for example, as I said before, for the retros femoris indication is clearly based on gait analysis report. For the hamstrings, whether we uh, change indications after gait analysis or not, I think that is mainly related to a more comprehensive uh, approach of gait. Uh, for example, for uh, psoas related to uh, pelvis and hip motion, it's not a very good correlation between clinical and gait analysis. Other things we see is that sometimes we may uh, think about doing adductors, but if we see a good abduction during swing, we may want to change this uh, indication. These are just examples, but I just intend to show how, as a matter of fact, gait analysis can modify our choices. There are here a couple of papers I will show you uh, searching for some evidence about uh, do we know if, as a matter of fact, there is some evidence about the fact that if we do use gait analysis, we will have better results. Really, is not evidence, and I will let you know why. Um, but uh, what's interesting uh, from these articles is that, as a matter of fact, authors find that when um, surgical recommend for, when surgical uh, planning follow uh, recommendations from gait analysis, results at least look 
to be better. And for this group of uh, patients, this group of patients, there were three groups that were compared. There was, uh, and they, the authors look um, in terms of parameters for popliteal angle, agilate gait index, and the minimum knee flexion at single support. What they found was that for patients who, after gait analysis, did not have any surgery indicated, they didn't get worse. Um, and then they conclude that at least uh, without real evidence from gait analysis, it did help to not uh, recommend surgery. We also see, although there is no evidence, that for the group of patients, who did have surgery based on gait analysis for all parameters, um, they, got, they got better. So this uh, paper from uh, Dr. Narayanan just um, reminds us that gait analysis has a lot to contribute to improve knowledge, which I think is very important about gait pathology. Um, also uh, provides with an objective measurement that allow us to compare uh, pre and post treatment. Of course, there is no evidence that the use of gait analysis itself would allow for a better outcome because it's not very clear whether gait analysis parameters would be related to uh, function or quality of life or not. And these are things that uh, have to be taken into account when the results of uh, surgical treatment are evaluated. And this is um, the reason why I think uh, it's very difficult to um, have evidence-based uh, in surgery because um, something is different from medicine is that surgery is uh, dependent on the surgeon, even though the same procedure is done. Uh, when you uh, just uh, give a pill to a patient, the effect of the pill, it won't be dependent on the person who is administrating the medication. And I think this is one of the limits for uh, when we search for uh, evidence base in surgery. Also in pediatrics, uh, one of the problems is that um, there are sometimes ethical considerations to make, like if we uh, decide uh, to do a randomized study, but we do know or we do think that one of the treatments would be better than the other one, that would be a problem for uh, research. And also taking into account the fact that there is growth. So as a matter of fact, in pediatrics, we would need to uh, actually conduct very long-term studies in order to proper evaluate the final results. So I think that we, even without evidence, uh, we can assume that uh, in pediatric orthopedic surgery and also to applies to cerebral palsy, uh, actually consensus can be reached based uh, not only on uh, scientific evidence, but expert opinion. And, and I think it's an important thing to take into account. So I just go into the conclusion. Uh, we may not have evidence, but we do have clinical facts about gait analysis. Um, we do know that nowadays gait analysis, uh, 3D gait analysis, represents an advantage for uh, some pathologies, clearly. Um, there is also evidence that gait analysis measurements are more repeatable than those uh, based on conventional clinical examination. We, it's important we keep in mind that the aim of gait analysis is to make and to interpret biomechanical data, eventually recommendations for treatment can be provided, but it is crucial to have a good knowledge of the clinical features that could impact 
uh, the abnormalities uh, of gait we see in order to establish, to interpret, to establish this link between biomechanical data and gait abnormalities. And I kind of uh, like this uh, sentence that said, any clinical gait analysis service, and I think it would apply for whatever, pediatric orthopedic service or doesn't matter, is only as good as the staff who work within it. So this would be my conclusion, but since I just found these words written down, I thought that myself, I wouldn't be able to say it better. So I borrow um, these sentences, these conclusions from uh, Mark Abel and Diane Damiano, who actually said that the management of cerebral palsy has evolved substantially during the last years, and that actually uh, motion al analysis laboratories had uh, have still a very important role in this development by uh, providing uh, data that allow us to analyze things, uh, to come out with some uh, therapeutic decisions, to exchange, I would say, between clinicians, and also to be able to do research and to do teaching. So I finish with this. I know I should answer this question. The question was, does 3D clinical gait analysis improve decision making? So here is my answer. I think yes. I think yes, uh, because I think for the goals I had myself when I went into the gait analysis field about getting a better understanding of gait, about getting knowledge, being able to do uh, research, uh, maybe taking better decisions for my patients. I do think that these goals were somehow accomplished, but there is another reason that I just didn't mention, and is the fact that on top of that, you can make a lot of friends when you go into gait analysis. So I thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, uh, Anna, for a wonderful exposition on the topic. Now uh, the session is open for the questions. Sandeep, can you take the first question? Yes, yes, sir. So thank you, Anna, for that wonderful talk on uh, gait analysis and its relevance. Uh, it was quite lucid. And Dr. Thomas from Vellore CMC wants to ask, uh, what is the role of uh, torsional CT scan studies for the torsion rotation uh, deformities when there is no concordance uh, between clinical findings and the mm -hmm. 3D gate analysis data? When do you rely on CT scans for torsion? Yes, well, um, for me, uh, it's a pretty clear answer because actually after some review of the literature that kind of show that um, when you uh, do uh, clinical measurements of uh, tibial torsion or femoral anteversion, uh, that would be good enough for clinical purposes. So because also we have to pay a lot of attention of on the amount of radiation when we uh, do uh, scanning for kids, we do not use uh, scan examinations uh, to measure torsion in pediatrics at least. So that's what we do now. On the other hand, uh, something that I think is important data and comes from the literature is being seen that, for example, when you correct uh, femoral anteversion in a patient with cerebral palsy, and you measure properly in, let's say, in OR, and you use uh, some compass system or whatever. And then you say, OK, I am the rotating 30 degrees. But then when you go and look to what happened after during gait, 
um, those 30 degrees, it happens that they are not 30 degrees anymore, but they may be 50 or they may be 50 or something like that. So I think that I okay. would say oh, yeah. these three things together, the fact that uh, clinical assessment looks pretty good, the fact that uh, many other things are interacting uh, to uh, create a torsion and rotational abnormalities during gait um, because of the literature has shown and the fact that we don't want to uh, use uh, highly irradiating examinations for kids. Okay. We just decide not to use them. Okay, so you are not in favor of too many CT scans, right? Mm -mm. No. Okay, so I will hand over to the panel who's there on the live meeting. Uh, there are no other questions from other delegates. Diren, by over to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Mauro, can you start? Uh, you have a question to Anna. Yeah, so please. Sure, thank you. Anna, thank you for your, your talk, which was outstanding. I really enjoyed it very much. I particularly like your thoughts about the transverse plane. So, in my opinion, the soft tissue procedures have been underestimated over the last years. Uh, I'd like to know what is your experience about the soft tissue procedures uh, regarding the transverse plane, and which procedures can really change the pattern of motion in transverse plane, according but, to your yeah. experience? You, um, yeah, you're talking about splint, splint right? I, I don't. No. I, I'm not sure if I get your 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 question right. Could could you please repeat it? Sorry. Yes, for sure. For sure. Uh, I saw during your presentation uh, changes in transverse plane after uh, tricep surgery lengthening, after hamstring surgery lengthening. Yes. So I believe that you have some experience with good results after soft tissue procedures in transverse yeah. plane, uh, uh, excluding femoral rotation of shoulder. So I'd like to know uh, which procedures uh, doing at soft tissues you believe that can can change the, the transverse plane. Yes, motion. yes, at, at, at yes. Meat, at, at food, mm. at the transverse plane. Yeah, I think that, for example, um, something that I've seen uh, many times that really influences uh, rotation, for example, is adductors. When, when you have tight adductor muscles, um, I think this has a strong influence on rotation. And then I really tend, for example, uh, if I, let's say, I have a patient who may have uh, a femoral antiversion, but within borderline limits. And I may not be sure about the fact that I do need to go and do bilateral the rotations. Then uh, for those cases, I, I would say maybe 90% of the times, I was um, satisfied with the results after, of course, adapters are gonna be always combined with something else. Something I tend to do, for example, and mainly for those patients who are a very good ambulators with a very good level, um, when I think about adapters, uh, I also think about, for example, semitendinosus. I think the um, couple between uh, semitendinosus muscle and adductors, both when are tight or uh, very much spastic, for example, they are really uh, internal hip rotators. And I have good experience with that. I am not, it's interesting because I, I know that and I've been uh, reading articles and, and watching webinars about uh, the um, hamstrings transfer, which I'm, I, I, I don't know because uh, I, I, don't, uh, I haven't uh, done that yet, but I am becoming very interested. Uh, so I wonder if maybe, for example, with uh, the transfers of the hamstrings, if do you do it maybe uh, for a younger patient at a point where they just start uh, getting some uh, tightness, but they are not.
I think there is a problem with the. Jayant, can you ask your question? Uh, sure, but I'm not sure Anna is listening. Yeah, but we can ask to Freiman and um, yes. Mauro. So my question was about uh, uh, hip extensor power. We talk a lot about the plant flexion knee extension couple, but in stance, the hip extensor is also working. And I think we are paying less attention to hip extensors. So I just wanted to ask Anna how she assesses the power of hip extensors and how excuse important me, that is. Excuse me, I, I just ah, show you back. Yes, I got I got disconnected. Um, wh where I was when I got disconnected? Wh what, what do you remember? I was I was saying what? Um, no, Anna, we have come to a second question. We will take that question. Uh, uh, Jain, can you repeat your question? Yeah, sure. Sorry. No, no, no problem. So, but, no, we always talk about plant flexion knee extension couple, and we know that uh, plant flexors are very important to get knee extension. But what about yes. hip, um, and hip extension? And that is something I feel we are, we are not paying enough attention to. Um, do, do you do you look at uh, hip powers um, in terms of your kinetics? Mm. Yes, as a matter of fact, yes. Um, I also I, I always try to look at both. Uh, because those are the main uh, power generators. So, um, and I think that that's probably uh, the key uh, for when we talk about like balance or like global alignment, those are probably the key muscles, like having a good uh, alignment of the pelvic bone and also having good power. Um, it's difficult to say. Some, what I, I usually look a lot, like for example, if I am thinking about uh, should I lengthen gastrox or not? Definitely go and look for power. Uh, for a patient who actually is not uh, developing almost any power, I really would be very afraid of doing lengthenings. Maybe I prefer to just uh, compensate with a splint or something like that. Um, what I sometimes uh, choose to do, like for example, uh, a patient who may have some degree of plantar flexion, as a matter of fact, because it has some shortness of the gastrox. And then you would say, okay, but we still need the patient to be a uh, full plantar contact because it's also a principle of gait. But in some cases, what I would prefer is to leave a little bit of plantar flexion to compensate uh, with an insole or something like that in, into the, the splint. And I, I rather go that way. I rather go that way if I think that the patient is really not very strong. It's, I think it's more difficult for the hip extensors thing because well, um, the hamstrings, uh, I think, uh, the hamstrings on the hip flexors, they control the balance between the position of the knee and the position of the hip. And of course, the goal is more you keep the knee aligned, I think, more you probably help to also keep the hip align. Good thing with patients who have good functional level is they don't, in general, have a lot of problem with knee, fle uh, sorry, with a uh, hip flexion contracture. So at least you don't have that and you have mostly to deal with the hamstrings thing. But I think it's very difficult, the hamstrings thing, because... So let's say, um, Anna, if we have someone who already has tight hamstrings, but he has a anterior, significant anterior pelvic tilt, so you know yes. that his hip extensors are quite weak, would you yes. still go and release the hamstrings in those cases where you already have a lot of anterior pelvic tilt? 
No, I, I well, if the patient is like I assume the there is, a, it will be a patient uh, with uh, excessive knee flexion. So, um, I think that uh, many times I prefer not to lengthen the hamstrings. If I have a knee flexion contracture, maybe I will prefer to do some uh, knee extension shortening osteotomy. And I do, I do think that uh, patellar advancement procedures, or I, I know I, I don't do um, patellar tendon shortening. I, I never did it because I am pretty happy with the results from patellar advancement, but I do know that is also a, a well-known procedure. But I think that um, when you are uh, able uh, to get a pretty good um, knee, active knee extension, for me, that, mm, I would say that prevents quite a lot from maybe going again into a pattern of excessive flexion with pelvic antiversion and so on. I don't know. I tend to think maybe lately <laughs> that if we keep sometimes um, muscles a little bit short, uh, mainly for patients that um, don't have a very good function, maybe um, that shortness of muscles would add as a sort of um, some protective string or, or something like that. I, I don't know. It's, it makes part of my thoughts about that. Okay, thank you, Anna. Like, uh, Freeman, now I have a question for you. You have a vast experience. Uh, gait analysis gives us a lot of information. At any point in any patient, have you felt that uh, gait analysis has led you to a wrong direction and to a wrong decision? Uh, well, I... My experience over time has been that I've definitely learned things. And, a, and an example was early on when I was doing gait analysis, I was doing quite a few psoas lengthenings, sort of in line with the concern that we should augment hip extension power. However, lengthening iliop psoas does not make the extensor stronger. And what I found is that there was very little benefit, and plus patients were complaining of weak hip flexors, mm -hmm. some, not everybody, a few, for things like stepping up onto steps, stepping into buses. So that's one place where I sort of made a turn and have largely, I mean, only on rare occasions to do so as lengthenings uh, with significant contractures. And uh, I think, um, I, you know, other mistakes that I have made, I mean, again, there is the concept that we should leave the hamstrings tight. And when you have a severe knee flexion contracture, I definitely have made errors based on the gait analysis, thinking the hamstrings, we really need to protect their length that we should just extend the knee for the knee flexion contracture, but then ending up getting problems with sciatic palsies because the knee extension contracture is uh, uh, extending the knee against that without sufficient shortening risks the sciatic mm -hmm. nerve. So those are some of the issues that uh, I sort of, I think in, in some ways, the gait analysis probably led me astray till I had to learn some okay. of it. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's a very good uh, tip and we will be very careful now in making the decision. Now, one of the major problem in cerebral palsy is plano valgus uh, foot. So I would like to understand like how gait analysis help us in decision making in plano valgus foot. Yeah, uh, shall we start with Mauro first? Like, what is your opinion? How gait analysis help us in decision making in plano valgus foot? I believe that the, the, the foot model is the weakest part of gait analysis. 
So for decisions about fit, uh, gate analysis may be lack of, of use, useless. So you must combine the, 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 the data. So the data from clinical examination, the x-rays, and the pyrobatograph when available can be add some information about the, the foot indications. But the, the gate analysis per se, uh, sometimes uh, don't provide uh, so many uh, information for this indication. I use gate analysis uh, the, the video. I try to, to, to identify the, the, the midfoot break in the stance phase, uh, as Anna said in her talk. And also, uh, I try to identify some problems in the kinetics, and the combination sometimes of rib problems, internal reputation, combined to external torsion to plantar valgus, can lead to a, a changes in the valgus, varus valgus moment in coronal plane. So there are some indirect points can lead to a, a indication for plantar valgus correcting. But in my opinion, there is no uh, just one point can justify the indication. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Freeman, do you agree with this point? Like uh, for the plano valgus foot, gate analysis does not give us adequate information and we need something more. Yes, I think the for me, the PDA bear graph is important. Uh, I think the uh, assessing the kinetics, looking at the power and the alignment. So when you have a foot that is out of alignment, that's generate not generating good moment or good power because of that alignment. And, and also the age is, for me, the age is extremely important. So, uh, you know, a five-year-old child, I would never do foot surgery unless, uh, yeah, you can always use a brace on a five-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year, a, a six-year-old. But once you get up to, you know, a full adult size, 14, 15-year-old, then having a stable foot is ever so much more important in my estimation. And, uh, you know, having midfoot breaks, uh, those are things that, that you really want to try to avoid. So looking and uh, not, uh, I agree with Anna's comment that leaving a little bit of a tight plantar flexor is good. It's good as long as you're not getting a midfoot break. If you start getting the midfoot breaking down, and this is another place where some therapists are very aggressive about wanting to cast for plantar flexors, but what they really do is break down the midfoot. This is a very bad outcome. And those mm -hmm. are things to try to avoid. And I agree that we use the multi-segment foot model, but I agree completely that it's, um, it's not all that accurate and uh, it's not nearly as accurate as the remaining kinematics. Dr. Miller, if I may ask, does doing a gastroc release earlier in life, does that prevent a midfoot break or is it going to happen anyway? No, I think it does prevent it. Uh, that's my opinion. I don't think we have very good evidence to that because the problem is there is so much diversity in the natural history. And that's one of the things that we've been work looking at very strongly. But I have good examples of terrible plano valgus feet with bunions at age three or four, who by the time they're 10 or 12, end up having a varus foot. And I must say a lot of those have had gastroc lengthenings I don't know that the gastroc lengthening was the cause of that, or if it's just the natural history. And uh, that's, but that's the dilemma. I, I think it's, if you have especially a big discrepancy between gastroc and soleus, and the child's getting a midfoot break, I think mm. it's a good thing to do. Yeah, we are just coming to end of the session, but before that, uh, a quick question. Like, do you use gait analysis for deciding the orthosis, the type of orthosis, or whether to go for orthosis? For that question, uh, do you use uh, gait analysis? Well, we are not able to do that because of the cost. I think it's a useful thing to do, but we are not able to do that. 
Yeah, Anna, in your practice, do you use that uh, for the deciding the orthosis? Yes, yes, yes. We actually, uh, when we, uh, not every, all the time, but when we have some uh, doubts, uh, we tend to do gait analysis with and without a type of orthosis. And this sometimes helps uh, to make a decision. So uh, we may, we may use it for a uh, choice uh, about orthosis. Okay, and Mauro, in your practice in Brazil, do you use that for the decision making for orthosis? Yes, we do. And, we, and you, can, you can teach the, the rehabilitation team, the physical therapists, about the indications. And the physical therapists here in Brazil, they, they love the, the articulate orthosis, the rigid orthosis. Sometimes the, the, the patients uh, don't have the control of ankle dorsal flexion in phase. So we do the examination and show to them there's no control of ankle dorsal flexion. So there is no indication for a uh, rigid orthosis. Mm. I, I, I fully agree with that. Okay, uh, thank you, Sandeep. Now you can uh, take the last uh, ceremony. That's a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, let me first thank uh, Anna Prasido for sparing time and uh, deliberating about uh, the role of 3D gait analysis. Uh, to my mind, it's really a, a, a sort of a conflict between uh, uh, the haves and the haves not, because I don't think 80% uh, to 90% of people in India have access to a 3D gait analysis. And we are dealing with our community based on clinical experience and whatever knowledge we gather from webinars like these to help us guide our uh, uh, approach to our patients who come from a sort of a semi-rural or a poor background who cannot really afford uh, 3D gate analysis even for decision making, leave alone braces. So it's good to learn, but again, uh, it's like uh, you have to customize the treatment uh, to your community and circumstance. And I think Dr. Freeman Miller, with his words of wisdom, the more I see senior orthopedic surgeons who have a long uh, clinical practice, the more conservative they become. That is my observation. Because in CP especially, we found that the natural history is so hurtling that all your best efforts at gathering evidence, really, the disease wins all the time. And thank you very much, Mauro, for sparing time. Jayant and Taral, who are the stalwarts of 3D gate analysis in India, they continue to teach and guide us and all the therapists in the country. So with those words, good night, everyone. And thank you, Anna, again. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Ashok, you can stop recording. Bye bye, Anna. Bye bye. bye.